All right, so welcome everybody to Black Hat Amsterdam in 2013. Uh, I'm really excited to be back. One, because I missed last year's return to Amsterdam and it was the first Black Hat I'd missed in 15 years. So it felt pretty bad to miss it last year, but now it feels really good to be back. So welcome. This is one of the largest conferences we've ever done uh, in Amsterdam. Last year we had maybe 400 people. We had a little over 400 people over three days, three tracks. And this year we've grown to over almost 500 people. And this time we're over two days. We have five tracks of speaking, which is a record. And then we've also offered six training classes that were really well attended. And, uh, and I think this is just an indication of how much demand there is out there to understand what it is that we do. You know, what makes uh, security tick? And I think this is coming from a bunch of different directions, whether it's people trying to refine their skills to say, stay relevant, or it's uh, people trying to stay on the cutting edge. And so I don't expect these trends to decline. Another thing we do at Black Hat, um, besides trying to offer really good uh, content, speeches, and training, is we really try to take your feedback into account and adapt ourselves to what the current trends are. And uh, we do this through a couple of different ways. Some of you might have noticed we have a uh, community-based uh, content CFP review board. Uh, some of the review board people are here. Um, and what we do is we really delegate to them as the subject matter experts to help go through all the CFP submissions that we get and really pick sort of the best talks that we can. And what we're doing this year is we're making that process even more transparent and we're really trying to engage the community even more into the day-to-day -day selection at Black Hat. And so in the future you'll also see a much more open selection of talks and you'll see the review board actually building areas of uh, focus. And so we think that'll be really exciting. So instead of us sitting in the back room trying to decide what's going to be hot, we really are getting it directly from the community. And another thing we're trying to do is get more feedback from you. And in the past we've tried a whole bunch of different things online systems, written notepads. Um, this time if you go to m.blackhat.com we've got an iOS uh, iPhone app and an Android app. And essentially um, we've got in there some other functionality but one of the buttons is surveys. And it's only five questions. So if you can take the time to answer five questions for us, it will really help steer the direction of the conference. You know, what you think works, what you think don't work and we can adapt ourselves to that. So it really means a lot to us and allow us to give you better content in the future. Um, also there's going to be a, a post show survey with some prizes after the conference uh, that should arrive in your email. The other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to adapt and we're trying to grow. So what you're going to see this year are some new things we have never done before. We're going to launch what we're calling the regional security summits. And so think of it as focused content uh, selected by people in regions, local regional experts, combined with training. And our first one is going to be in Istanbul, Turkey in September. And we're also launching what we're calling training events. And this is like a training only focused event. The first one will be on the west coast in Seattle. And it's going to be uh, in December. And it's going to offer 10 to 20 trainings. So it's going to be essentially a large dedicated training event on all of our best training classes. And we're going to see how, much, how many people respond to that. And then also later on in November we're going to launch a uh, Black Hat Regional su Summit in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we're trying some new regions and we're trying some new content. <coughs> the other thing I've been looking at is what are the big trends? And what I think is happening here is at this conference you're going to notice there's a lot of talks relating to uh, mobile devices, the emergence of mobile is becoming the dominant platform. Embedded devices. This plat when, when I say embedded I'm talking about anything that essentially runs embedded uh, flash ROM, something you can get out with a JTAG port. And these become, you would think that the green field of embedded would have sort of died out by now. But if anything it's only accelerated. In the early days I think researchers saw it as a green field. And researchers love green fields, right? Remember when it was physical lock picking everybody flocked to? Uh, access control systems everybody went to? Then it was embedded systems, SCADA, uh, industrial control. Well, embedded is, is continuing. 
And I think it's because you see now talks on, uh, on CAN bus and uh, automated car co control systems. And we also see a continued focus on low-level research. And I like to think of that as sort of the professionalization of the of exploits, of kernel-level exploits. You know, and we're seeing professionalization in the frameworks used to find these exploits and develop them, the toolkits that take advantage of them, and even the marketplaces in which uh, these exploits are being sold and monetized. And this is a trend um, that I see continuing. And on the other side of things, we see governments getting more and more involved. Uh, and you'll notice that from, from some of the remarks our keynote speaker has to say, that, that we are now reached the level of consciousness in what we do, that national governments are paying attention and that's a good thing and that's a bad thing, right? It's a two-edged sword. Um, you see talks now starting between the United States and China over internationalized norms of behavior. What does that mean? Nobody knows yet. But I have a feeling it's going to revolve around what is a, uh, acceptable and they're going to be confidence building measures. So for example, every country of the world has a norm against child abuse. So I have a feeling that child abuse materials, that's going to be an international norm. We don't accept that. We don't accept botnets. We don't accept spam. And we're going to start building treaties around this stuff. And then we're going to start passing laws around this stuff. And next thing you know, we're going to have some experience working with each other as countries. And then the next stage will start. And that becomes a lot more murky. What happens when we get past the easy norms and start moving on to the more difficult norms? Norms that might impact freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Something in the West might be freedom of expression. Something in the uh, East may not. So these are going to be really exciting times and we're going to be the people involved in all these debates. We're going to be the subject matter experts that people come to and ask us for opinions. We're going to be the people that write articles and talk about this stuff or educate politicians so they can make more informed decisions. So I'm really excited for this, uh, this time in history. I thought this would have happened 10 years ago. It didn't. It's happening now and I'm glad to still be around for it. I'm glad you're here for it. So with that said, I want to like to thank some of the people that made this conference possible, and that's primarily our sponsors. And that would include our key sponsor, Diamond Sponsor Qualys, our Platinum Plus sponsors of Firehost and RSA, and then our Platinum sponsors of FireEye and GFI. So now, it's my pleasure to introduce Francois Graciolet, the CSO of the EMA region for Qualys, and I'd like to thank Qualys. They're a decade-long sponsor. And they've sort of stuck with uh, Black Hat through the thick and thin. And, uh, and so it's a pleasure of mine to introduce Francois, who will now introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Black Hat Europe 2013. Thank you for joining us. My name is Francois Gracioli. I'm working for, as a CSO for Qualys in the EMEA region. This year, Qualys is pleased to be the diamond sponsor for the Black Hat in Europe. We have been a huge supporter of the Black Hat uh, since around the world since 2003. From our perspective, the Black Hat is the most important security event as it brings the security community all together with one mission, to fight cyber threats. Today, we are more connected than ever, and with the rapid growth of the hyper-connected world of devices and the Internet of Things, the acted vectors are increasing dramatically. The researches presented at Black Hat help us to better understand the flaws of the IT system so we can secure them for the future. Black Hat is also unique in the sense it brings together security researchers, practitioners, and high-level professionals from both the government and the private sectors, fostering collaboration to better understand the freight landscape so we can continue to innovate a lot and devise new security solutions. Tonight, we will be sponsoring the evening reception, and I would like to invite all of you to join us in our booth starting at 6 p.m. In addition, we will have a gift raffle, so we will be able to win a mini iPad and Apple TV or gift card. So, Please enjoy, enjoy the party. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker for today, Mr. Rick Faninger, a top global thinker according to the Time magazine. 
Rilke, with his dedication to civil liberties and internal sovereignty, founded the first pirate party in 2006 in Sweden. The Tech Driven Party has established organi political organizations all over the world, and Wilk has been his leading advocate and political evangelist for trans transparency, anonymity, and sensible copyright laws. He's one of the most of the world's most influential people, according to Time magazine. So now, please join me in welcoming Rim with a round of applause. Morning, all. It's really humbling to have the honor of opening such a prestigious conference as Black Hat. So a uh, big thank you to the organizers who uh, gave me this opportunity. However, as prestigious as Black Hat is, I'm afraid I have to open with a confession. I know you shouldn't start the keynote on a negative note, but in the, in the interest of transparency, I feel I have to declare something. I'm a politician. <laughs> I was a happy coder once with an honest job, dressed properly in jeans and t-shirt. Now look at me. It didn't I didn't intend for things to happen that way. I just started talking politics and what was wrong with the world on Friday and Saturday evenings over beer with my friends, you know. And before I knew it, I was starting discussing a little politics pretty much every day of the week. It crept in over coffee. It, daily, it gradually took over my life. And now look at me. Here I am having started a global political movement that has spread to 60 countries. And it can happen to anybody in this room. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But first, today's topic is shelters or windmills. A little bit mystic there. The struggle for power and information advantage. I'm Falkvinge. On, okay, so this guy doesn't have focus. Let's fix that. Click, and yeah, there we go. I'm Falkvinge on Twitter. I love seeing my name on Twitter. Whenever you think I say something funny, whenever you think I'm boring, whenever you don't think of me at all, just mention my name on Twitter. I love seeing it there. So, a brief introduction before we start. How many in here have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party? Let's see a show of hands. I, I'd say that's about two-thirds. And that's kind of funny. I mean, wherever I present in the world, that's fairly consistent. It's so consistent that I put it in the slides. And then just for kicks, how many in here have heard of any other Swedish political party? Let's see a show of hands. Yeah, there are some scattered hands, which, again, is fairly consistent wherever I present in the world, so I put it in the slides. <laughs> And that tells you something about what's going on in the underbrush here. That tells you something about that there's a global movement that people are sort of gradually aware of. So I founded the first Pirate Party. That's my, that's my background on January 1st, 2006. Uh, we put two people in the European Parliament in our first real success election on 2009, and it's since then spread to 60, over 60 countries. And we have people in senates, on local councils, in state parliaments, and so on. You'll see the logo European Pirate Academy here. That's basically our public speak, the, the logo we use for public speaking. So where I come from is the Pirate Party, even though you see the European Pirate Academy here. So today's topic, shelters or windmills. The struggle for power, the struggle for the information advantage. Shelters or windmills? Today's entertainment we're, is a bit of a historical a story perspective. We're going to look at how governments behaved in the 16th century, how corporations behaved in the 19th century, and then look at today. 
and try to put all of that in perspective, try to see if we can find any common themes in between what's, going, what's been going on, and then draw conclusions from that to how we can, we can move on as a, as a community. As part of this, I'll be quoting various sources. I'll be quoting Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. I'll be quoting Battlestar Galactica, Chinese proverbs. I'll be quoting Old Norse verses in Old Norse. And, and I'll also be misquoting a couple of people who I think believe, deserve it. So, a history of control over knowledge, but also a history of sharing. It turns out that sharing, the desire to share culture and knowledge, is really, really deeply embedded in our genes. So, if we go back, or rather, let's start with, when I speak to sociologists about the net, they generally divide into two groups. The first group tells me that the net is the greatest and most important invention of mankind since the printing press 600 years ago. That's quite a bold statement. The second group disagrees with this and tells me that's not true. Rather, they claim that the internet is the most important invention of mankind since the written language 6,000 years ago. And that does put in perspective just how large a power shift we are part of right now. So let's take a look at what, what had happened before. When we had the Catholic Church in, um, say, 14th century, when they were producing or duplicating knowledge and culture, they were copying books laboriously by hand. Monks and nuns would take months and years to copy books just to make one additional copy. And they made this out of skin, animal hides, which was expensive. So producing or duplicating knowledge and culture in this time was expensive, both in terms of manpower and materials. But what this provided to the organization having control of this structure was the power of interpretation. They had the ability to dictate what was true. And thus they never needed to fear any law being made against their interest because they controlled the entire worldview of the, world, of the world's legislators. Since there was one source of knowledge and culture, they controlled what everybody else knew. And this, is, this goes farther than you'd, re, you'd realize at first thought. If you can control what other people know, that is the greatest power you could possibly have. When, I, when we hear, hear about this the first time, we're thinking in terms of trainers plus six that will give us World of Warcraft gold, or we become rich, or we become famous. The thing is, if you controlled what was true and what wasn't, you wouldn't need money ever again that you wouldn't have to be afraid of a single law being made against your interests. And this was the situation these people were in. This is the information advantage. The information advantage. Knowing more about your opponent than they know about you, and more importantly, having the ability to commu out-communicate your adversaries. Having the ability to have your information become the norm or the template in society, the information advantage. And whenever you look at history in this lens, you can observe that whoever has held the information advantage has always climbed to power. There were even paramilitary inquisitions with the Catholic Church charged with upholding this information advantage for the church. If somebody discovered dangerous knowledge that would possibly upset the, the, this position of power, these inquisitions had a number of punishments to deal out, up to and including quite nasty torture. So 
this organization was very aware of the power it meant to hold the information advantage. Enter a small invention known as the printing press in 1453. It was actually a combination of four different inventions. Metal movable type, oil-based inks, cheap paper, very importantly, based on uh, discarded clothing, and uh, block press. Block press, metal movable type, oil-based ink, and cheap paper. And what this enabled was the ability to distribute knowledge and culture cheaply, quickly, and accurately by orders of magnitude compared to what was before. This set off an avalanche of people who wanted to publish, who people who wanted to spread ideas. For the first time in history, the middle class could actually publish their ideas, their novels, their thoughts, their feelings, and boy, did people publish. Everybody could suddenly afford having their stuff published, and they did. Plagiarism was rampant. Reverse plagiarism was even more rampant, as in taking your piece and putting a famous author's name under it so it would actually be read by somebody. It's like Leonardo da Vinci said, the medium is the message. Actually, he didn't say that. I just made it up to prove the point. So, imagine then you were the Catholic Church in this scenario, and you saw a lot of ideas being distributed without your permission, without your even ability to prevent it. And a lot of this you would see as genuine misinformation. I mean, if you've been in the position of interpreting reality for the world, that's not easily a position you can let go of. That's not easily a responsibility you can unlearn. So from their perspective, they saw a lot of misinformation being distributed through these new technologies. They saw a lot of dangerous ideas that should never have been distributed in the first place, taking hold, getting a foothold in society. So they tried to prevent that from happening. They started actually fighting the printing press. They started institu instituting punishments for unauthorized copying and an unauthorized distribution of knowledge and culture. These punishments were initially not particularly notable, but as they had no effect, they escalated and escalated and escalated until these punishments, oh, I missed something here, apparently. And I'll get back to that. Because there was some, somebody else who published something without permission here. He, he was two thirds of a Martin Luther King. He was Martin Luther. And he had his 95 thesis where, which he published on 1517 on the doors of the church. This was in a time when the Catholic Church was selling salvation. And he was very upset about that. It was essentially that they had discovered a way to bring in more income to the organization by selling letters of forgiveness. He saw this as corruption of the church corruption of the organization, and so he wanted to do something about it. Therefore, he put up his thesis, he used the printing press, and he started to publish the Bible in people's own languages. This is an image of um, Luther's Bible in German. They were also published in, in French and most other natural languages, which of course led to about 200 years of war across Europe. Which, were, which are known as the religious wars. Now, this is kind of where you pause for a moment and think, say what? People were actually willing to go to bloodshed over two centuries, depending on whether the Bible was in what language? But it goes deeper than that. This was just, this was just 
on the surface of things. Because when you think of it, the Bible had used to be in Latin. The Bible had used to be in Latin. What that meant was that the Catholic Church had had a power of interpretation of telling people what was in the Bible. Everybody knew that the Bible was true, but they had depended on people to interpret it. All of a sudden, they could read it themselves. The Catholic Church had had an ability to dictate truth. And all of a sudden, they had lost that because people could read the Bible themselves. They had lost a gatekeeper position. The Catholic Church had lost a gatekeeper position over knowledge and culture. And here's where we come back to their reaction. Imagine you see a lot of misinformation being spread. You'd obviously react with wanting to prevent that. You cannot unlearn having this, this, this responsibility of letting people know what is true and what false. So when you see misinformation being spread, you introduce punishments for unauthorized copying. You introduce punishments for unauthorized distribution of knowledge and culture. And this happened across Europe with the, with the aid of royalty. It was pretty much in the church's lap by this time. And these punishments escalated and escalated until on January January 13, 1535 in France, they hit the death penalty for using a printing press. Even the death penalty did not deter unauthorized copying. And here's kind of where we pause and ask ourselves, does any of this feel or sound familiar? What we learn is that there are many ways to deal with this kind of struggle. Another, may, another way was done, it was done another way in England by Queen Mary I. She saw the total disaster that was the ban in France, even by death penalty. So instead she went the, a monopoly route. She handed a monopoly to London Printing Guild for exclusive printing privileges in exchange for having the Crown's censors determine whatever saw the, day of, saw the light of day. So this monopoly was very effective in preventing dissent, preventing political speech that the Crown didn't want to see and the Church didn't want to see. It was awarded on May 4, 1557, and it was known as copyright. It is still around. I found a quote on the net saying that, beware of he who would deny you access to information, for in his heart he dreams himself your master. And whenever you look at history, whenever you sort of look at power struggles of information policy throughout history, you can observe that there's been a very clear red line People in power use their power to keep their power. And that's been very consistent through at least the 14th century. So what we see here is that the Protestants won eventually where, where these wars were being fought. They won through superior use of information infrastructure, the printing press. The old guard tried to ban this. They tried to fight the technology. The newcomers used the technology to their advantage, which gave them the, the information advantage. So all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. That, obviously, is a quote from Battlestar Galactica, but that doesn't make it any less true. Because it gives us a blueprint for how to come out on the winning side of this current struggle. And I'll be coming back to that towards the end of this presentation. Coming out of the struggle for the printing press, 
we saw a shift in society where corporations started to gain power, started to gain wealth, started to put themselves in the driver's seat. So what happened then? Well, we quickly observed that the corporations became the new gatekeepers of knowledge and culture for a number of, for a number of reasons. They very quickly learned the game that this game of information advantage, the game of if they control the truth, they can prevent competition, they can control their adversaries. And I'm going to give you two specific examples of how bad things can go and how well they can go. And of course you can prevent your replacement by something better. The first example is a red flag. It's a very literal red flag, it's not the warning sign. It's a very physical red flag. And this was from the invention of the automobile. Obviously, it wasn't called automobile when it was first invented, right? I mean, people always phrase objects in terms they understand at the time. But the automobile was mostly taken up by that time's techno nerds, and as we observe from today, we know what new trends do. This was not popular everywhere, so the current incumbent industries used the fear of the automobile and what it would bring to lobby for new laws. And I'm going to focus on something called the Red Flag Act of 1865. It stipulated that any automobile must have a crew of three people. They actually called it a crew. It must have a driver. Okay, I can live with that. They didn't have Google's driverless car at the time. It must have a stoker, which is somebody shuffling coal into the engine. And it must have a guy walking in front of the car waving a red flag. This is an image from the time. Now, what this does is that it ensures that the car can never move faster than walking speed. So, the car would become an excellent tool for transporting people and cargo to the railroad and stagecoach stations at the time. But it would never be able to compete with the railroad and stagecoach because it was limited to walking speed, right? And unsurprisingly, when you dig into who was behind this lobbying, it was the railroad and stagecoach industries that, discover, that was discovered almost centuries later. So what we see here is that somebody managed to exploit public fear into delaying an inevitable replacement. And as a result of this law in Britain, Germany's car industry got a head start out of, of almost 40 years. A head start it still retains 160 years later over Britain's car industry. And that tells you something that once a technology shift is underway, you should do everything you can to make it happen quickly, even if that means existing industries get in trouble. A partic right, so they were pretending to embrace the car. They were pretending to embrace the automobile, but only in as much it helped their business. Under no circumstance was it allowed to come into a position to threaten, a, threaten their business. So they were saying how great an invention this was and blah, 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 and therefore it cannot go any faster than walking speed. So in reality, they were choking it. A particular example comes from Pennsylvania. I mean, this, this law spread from Britain to the other parts of the English-speaking world. And they grew gradually more absurd. In Pennsylvania, the equivalent of the Red Flag Act said that if a driver, if an automobile driver sees cattle or horses up ahead on the road, they must immediately stop the vehicle, disassemble it, 
and hide all the parts in the nearest shrubbery <laughs> until the animals have passed. This law passed unanimously in the Pennsylvania legislature. Fortunately, it never became law because the governor nixed it through an executive veto. But it passed unanimously. Imagine that. We're laughing at it for good reason. So let's look at another example. I frequently hear, well, isn't there a right to make money? If we've invested all of this money, don't we have a right to profit of it? And people kind of get upset when I say, no, you don't. If you're investing, by definition, that's taking a risk. You don't have a right to reward. You don't have a right to return on investment. That's why it's called an investment. And I'd like to illustrate that by looking at the largest industries across Europe and the United States circa 1910, which was the ice making industry. Sounds odd today, but what this industry did was that they went out to lakes in wintertime, sawed off huge blocks of ice and stored them on sawdust in barns, and then carried these blocks of ice out to households to, to help them keep, cool, keep food cold in so-called ice boxes, because households did not have electricity. There was no refrigerator. When the refrigerator arrived in 1920, 1930, along with the electrification of households, when households got electricity, the largest industry in m almost every city in the United States and Europe disappeared in just five years. Just went off the map. And yet, not a single individual suggested a 3,000 euro refrigerator tax that would go to the ice makers union to compensate for loss of income. Technology has always changed business models and it's likely that it always will. So whenever somebody says that they have a right to profit, you you could always remember this ice maker's example, and I find that it's very, very useful that way. Newspapers, same thing, tying into information advantage. When newspapers arrived en masse in, um, in early 19th century, available to the masses, and they would even accept letters to the editor who would publish people, who would publish ideas from ordinary people. The academics and the elite of the time went ballistic. Who could possibly be interested in the opinions of the riffraff? Well, it turns out that the riffraff had interesting ideas, and that they were so many that building society with their inclusion was a much, much more competitive proposition than running it in an elite project fashion. It, w it goes on, looking at what happened in 1849. You had a project called libraries. Before, you'd, the books had been the privilege of the rich. They had been <coughs> gathered in private libraries who would sometimes want to distribute knowledge and culture to the masses, and so they would let ordinary folk come in and borrow their books. In 1849, there was a discussion in, uh, par in the British Parliament that you would open public libraries so that the access to knowledge and culture would not depend on a few rich people. Rather, it was a public interest. And at this point, the copyright industry went absolutely ballistic. They, they had previously argued that Parliament must make laws to make it illegal for people to lend books to one another because that's obviously stealing from the author. You can't read books without paying for them. So if you buy a book, they wanted it to make absolutely sure that that person and only that person had the right to actually read it. When Parliament started discussing public libraries, the, the copyright industry at the time, which was just the pub, book publishing industry, 
went absolutely ballistic saying, you can't possibly say that anybody should have the right to read anything without paying for it. If you pass this law, no author is going to make a living off of writing books ever again. If you open a public library, your public libraries across the United Kingdom, not a single book will ever be written again. But Parliament of the time was better able to balance interests and saw that the public's access to knowledge and culture had a larger public interest than some publishers' right to a penny every time a book cover was, was opened. And so the pu first public library in the UK did open in 1850. And as we all know, not a single book has indeed been written ever since. Either that or the, that particular argument is as bogus today as it, as it was then. The copyright industry has actually several enemies, not just the in terms of information advantage, not just libraries. To list a few of them, the self-playing piano and the gramophone would be, quote, the end of a vivid, songful humanity, end quote. Oh, there, there's the list. The end of a vivid, songful humanity. Broadcast radio was the reason for, for the collapse of the record industry noting that in 1929 the sales of record albums have, had fallen from $75 million to just $5 million, which is a catastrophic collapse by any measure. It happened to coincide with the Great Depression, but they didn't mention that. Broadcast uh, and loudspeakers, that was, a real, that was actually a tragedy for ma many professional musicians at the time, as um, movies started coming with sound. The uh, theaters fired their orchestras. They suggested that they would have some sort of guaranteed income for the, for the people who were out of a job. While I can certainly sympathize, sympathize with this particular fate and the fact that it hit the small guys, that didn't happen. 1940s, television. This should be banned. Who could possibly, this would be the end of movies. Who would possibly go see a movie in a cinema if you could see it for free at home? We cannot possibly compete with free. That's impossible. 1950s, tele cable television. Movie cinemas turned their argument from just a decade earlier on their head and said that we have to provide content for free. We cannot possibly compete with paid. You have to ban this ability to, take, to charge for, for movies, or we'll go out, go out of business. So it was first, we can't compete with free, and a decade later was, we, we cannot compete with paid. Uh, photocopiers would be the end of books, because who would buy a book if you can, if you can just copy it? Loudspeakers, again, when, uh, dance when DJs became popular and uh, Mixing records on the fly became more popular than having live music. The cassette tape, of course. This famous slogan, home taping is killing music. The dead Kennedys, who actually, uh, and this time you actually sold cassette tapes with music. The dead Kennedys famously printed this slogan on one of their tapes, only they modified it slightly to said, Home taping is killing record industry profits. And then they added, we left this side blank so you can help. <laughs> Page two. I could go on and on. I mean, you've seen, the, you've seen how the copyright industry acts. You've got the video cassette recorder. Oh yeah, the video cassette recorder was to the film industry as the Boston Strangler was to the woman home alone, according to Jack Valentia of the Motion Picture Association of America before Congress in a famous testimony. I could go on here, but you, the, picture is, the picture keeps repeating. Let's instead take a look at Right, what is the stagecoach and railroad industries of today with regard to the internet? 
who are trying to, who are pretending to embrace the internet, but actually choking it because it's going to disintegrate their business. Who are, who stand a threat to become completely obsolete by IP addressing over fiber. So they're pretending to embrace the internet, but really choking it. Who are pulling a red flag trick on the internet today? Any ideas? It's not the copyright industry. They are standing on the sidelines. Telcos. Say again? Telcos. Telcos, yes. Telcos and cable TV. Those who are providing bandwidth in a lot of countries, and unfortunately politicians trust them with rolling out internet. But these two industries will be disintegrated by the internet, and so they're trying to delay it and prevent it as long as possible. In contrast, we have entrepreneurs fibering apartments wholesale with, without this luggage. You, you easily see 100, uh, 100 megabit connections and gigabit connections. Let's take a look at the letter to understand how civil liberties come into this and the information advantage. I'm, I can be seen as bashing the copyright industry quite unashamedly, and I even enjoy doing it, to be honest. But to understand where this comes from, let's take a look at the letter. This is a centuries-old institution, the sealed letter. When our parents communicated, the letters they put in the mail had certain characteristics to it. It was anonymous. Our par parents, and our parents alone, determined whether they identify themselves as sender of a message on the outside of the envelope for the world to know, on the inside of the letter for only the recipient to know, or frankly, not at all. That was their prerogative. It was secret in transit. Nobody would open a letter to look for new crimes. Nobody would open a letter to look for copied drawing. Arguably, if you were under previous and formal suspicion of a very serious crime, your, let, your mails could be intercepted in transit and opened to look for additional evidence of the crime you were already under suspicion of. But not a single letter would be opened, at least not in the western parts of the world, to look for new crimes. It was untracked. Nobody had the right nor the capability to stand at every mailbox and see who was communicating with whom. I have a friend in China who told me that the first time he sent a letter there, he had to show ID to the postmaster at the post office who would enter his letter in a logbook about who, was, who he was communicating with. That's what we don't have. That's what our parents didn't have. And last but not least, the mailman is never ever responsible for the contents of a message. Last but not least, because they can't, they can't read it. They don't have a right to read it, so they're not responsible for it. We know that the postal services of Europe are the largest narcotics distributors in their respective countries. And yet, we know that this is something we hold the senders responsible for. We don't hold the mailman responsible. We don't, have the po we don't hold the postal services responsible. This might seem elementary. But one where I come from is that I say that it's absolutely reasonable that our children inherit the same rights to communicate using these civil liberties that our parents had in the environment they communicate in. And that's entirely regardless whether somebody can no longer make a profit. When I say that, when I present this case in a political setting, there's always somebody from the copyright industry saying, but you can't possibly mean this. If you allow some, if you allow anybody to send anything to anybody else, we cannot make a profit. And I say, quite honestly, so what? We do not determine civil liberties. 
based on who gets to make a profit or not. The entrepreneur's role in society is to make money given the current constraints, sociologically and technically. They do not get to dismantle civil liberties, even if they can't make money otherwise. That's how it should work. So it, it's not really rocket science where the position I come from. It's that our children should inherit the same civil liberties and communication that our parents had. So where are we today? We've looked at the, uh, we've looked at the, co the conflict in the 15th, 16th centuries. We've looked at how the struggle for power and information advantage moved up to corporations. So where are we today? We can observe that government is starting to seize corporate data. Sometimes I get the question whether corporations like Google or governments are more, import, are more dangerous to live civil liberties. I argue that's, that's not an XOR, that's an AND. It's the two in combination that are dangerous. When, gov when corporations can gather immense amounts of data about us and corporations can't just go in and get it, that's when things have the potential to get ugly. They're attacking the messenger immunity. You can see everywhere how this mailman's immunity is being eroded under the terms of judicial secondary liability. Meaning that everybody's trying to make internet service providers liable for what their users do. Simply because it's an easier target. But this is a fundamental civil liberty that I don't think we should get away, we should get rid of that easily. Wiretapping, bulk wiretapping is being introduced at a rate never seen before. In Sweden, the default was changed from you have a right to privacy to you are always wiretapped in 2008. The um, people who said that civil liberties activ activists don't have anything to worry about use the arguments that it's only going to be a quarter of, uh, almost a quarter of Sweden's population that is being actively wiretapped at any time. So you don't really have anything to worry about. I'm not joking. This, this is a law on the books now. It's called the FRA law if you want to look it up. We're being actively tracked on an individual basis. This device is no longer primarily a communications device. It's primarily a governmental tracking device, which can also make phone calls. And this is a quite worrying development. Governments and corporations together are killing the letter, the concept of the letter, and the civil liberties enshrined in the concept of the letter. And I think that's very alarming. And this is happening worldwide. The same actions are being taken worldwide. It is just the excuses that, that differ. In China, it's morality and stability of the nation. In Middle East, it tends to be sanctity of the prophet. Here in the West, it's always the same four reasons in any combination. It's organized crime, pedophilia, terrorism, and of course, file sharing. Find the odd one out. So the, the, it's only the excuses that differ. And we are seeing the, the strangest expressions of this. I'm going to take, take a look at a bill in, introduced in Arizona. Doesn't matter if you remember this number, but it was a, a bill saying that criminalization of hate speech online should be broadened quite significantly. And it's, it went as far as criminalizing annoying people online, essentially criminalizing trolling. So just imagine if I, when we're leaving this conference and I go to the airport 
I notice three books on the book stand. They're titled Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King. And so I get home, I sit down on my fantasy forum, and I do a real rage post about how I saw these books in the airport, and I can't believe how the greed of Hollywood has allowed this masterpiece, this epic trilogy of Lord of the Rings to become a book. And I just rage all over this. And then I sit down, relax, I bring a large bowl of popcorn and watch the ensuing entertainment. Politicians are actually introducing bills that would make this criminal, and I think that's a problem. If you want to see how, how important these civil liberties are to democracy, you could only watch as far as Egypt during the riots there last year. You remember ex-President Mubarak? When people started rioting and coordinating their protests over the net, he actually reacted with shutting it down. Now, you have to ask yourselves what, what the guy was thinking. I mean, he wanted to keep people indoors, so he takes away their games, porn, and cats. That, that's an obvious sign these guys do not understand the internet. Just as people who try to outlaw trolling. So what we're seeing is a reaction from the old guard, which is almost identical to the power struggle in the 16th century. We are seeing a militarization. We are seeing a violence being applied. First, fine, jail. And unfortunately, as this kind of shift, power shift, goes beyond a human lifetime, even, even death, and just as this is fairly timeless, I mean, I'm talking about things that happened 500 years ago and are happening now again. Um, I'm looking to wisdom that was written over 500 years ago to understand the situation and to understand how people felt back then. And for me personally, that helps me understand how to cope with it today. And I'm, since I'm Scandinavian, how many Scandinavians are here? Norwegian, Danes, Swedes, Icelandic? Okay, quite a few. So there's an Old Norse verse, which I'm going to read in, read in Old Norse. I'll, it'll also be translated. I'm going to read and translate it to the best of my ability, but, but it kind of tells you that people have always been dealing with this. The verse goes, Deir fie, deir freinder, deir sielv id sama, en ord stir deir aldre, gweimer sier god angethur, deir fie, deir freinder, deir sielv id sama, ech wet ein at aldri deir, Domrum Dauden Vern. People have asked me where I come from in terms of ethics, where I come from in terms of conscience, and where I come from, where, essentially, where I try to pull the world. And I think that could be summed up, I'm sorry, that, that, that still gets to me. I think that can be summed up in two sentences. The first is that curiosity is not a crime. Curiosity is never ever a crime. And the second is that, however, locking up knowledge and culture is. That's where I come from. And unfortunately, the laws of today 
are not saying this. So I'm doing what I can to change that. In the meantime, it is up to each and every one to do what they can if, to change the, the world in their, the direction they believe in. If this is the world, if this is the direction you believe in, I would, I, I can't encourage, I can't technically encourage you to, to commit a crime, but I can say that it's a moral imperative to break laws you don't believe in, that you believe are unjust. Throughout history, those who have taken, those who have done what is right before what is legal have always been justified, even if, even if much later. So, going back to the blueprint I spoke about, what did the people in the 16th century do that led them to come out on the winning side? What can we learn from the religious wars 500 years ago and apply today? It was the same struggle, it was the same social conflict, and people haven't changed. Power struggles haven't changed. Our clothes have changed. The locations haven't necessarily changed. Our faces have changed. How we work haven't. The technology has changed, but people are still people. We s we're seeing a militarization and a war on knowledge today, just as we did then. And it was won 500 years ago by spreading knowledge. It was won by defying the war on knowledge and sharing, distributing knowledge and culture. Once you've learned what it's like to share and seek knowledge and culture, you cannot unlearn it. You cannot unlearn it. Just like you couldn't unlearn what it was like to read the Bible in your own language 500 years ago. And a person who has learned this will permanently be in favor of the right to be curious and the right to share knowledge and culture with, with our fellow human beings. We hold the information advantage. It is us in this room who have the strategic upper hand. Yes, it's true that government are cracking down on this because that's the only tool they have. But we hold the strategic upper hand in this battle. Everybody in this room, we have the information advantage and we have the infrastructure advantage. We know how to use these tools to an extent that the people who want to silence us can never achieve. They, they don't even understand what they can't achieve. That's how big an advantage we have. So, they did three things, and it's three things that we can copy from them. The first is that they taught people on a one-to-one -one basis what had changed. And they taught people how to use their new technology to their advantage, becoming part of the information advantage that rolled out. The many become an unstoppable avalanche once you get this information flow going. The second is the, that the transgressions from the old God were documented and spread and shared. If you look at the, um, I mentioned Bloody Mary earlier, one reason that they lost sympathy was that people actually documented how she burnt 300 families at the stake just for being Protestant families. And as a result, there was a huge social shift that left her supportless and her movement supportless. 
We can do that today. I'm not sure if you looked closer at the photos from the Arab Spring of those protests. But one thing that strikes you is that in every photo, there are people holding up their mobile phones like this to take additional pictures. You can always see more mobile phones in the picture, taking pictures. So what was amazing about that was that each documentation of a transgression also included instructions on how to carry on the message because you'd see people taking more pictures. And third, stand by one another. Because we know that the old guard is trying to make examples, scaring examples, out of individuals. I mentioned one example earlier. But we also know that there is millions of us and only a few thousand of them. So the one for all, all for one was a key concept that allowed the previous information revolution to succeed. And it's one that's going to be necessary in this one as well. These three key elements were the blueprint last time around. And given the fact that people are people and that it's a fairly identical power struggle, this is the blueprint I'm going to bet on to get out of this. It's, we're not anywhere near the end of this yet. Punishments are going to escalate. The old guard is going to try to militarize even further, jack up punishments, make examples. But we do hold the information advantage. Everybody in this room holds the information advantage. Shelters or windmills, the title of this talk, with three minutes and 50 seconds to go. Shelters or windmills? Shelters or windmills? There is a Chinese proverb saying that in winds of change, some people build shelters and others windmills. And I think that's a nice thought. You outbuild your adversaries, you disrupt and you outcompete. That's always been the recipe. So before, before I close, I mentioned the letter and sort of where I come from. I have a couple of uh, free books here to hand out if anybody's interested. They're just up for grabs. If, if they do run out, there's some two dozen of them. You can just mail me and I'll be happy to send, send more of them to you. So a final observation. A final observation here before you close. It used to be that authority was sold. It was sold by people in power. And the reason it could be sold was that it was controlled. It was controlled, it could be controlled because it was scarce. Only a small selected elite had the ability to communicate what was true and false to the rest of the public. But that's not, the, that's not the case anymore. Authority has become abundant. Authority has become abundant. Imagine the panic in those who used to sell authority as part of this shift. So, Change, change doesn't just happen. Change does not just happen. It is always somebody that makes change happen. So the final sentence of this presentation and the one key message I would like you to take out of this grand ballroom today is, do you want to be that person? Do you want to be that person? Thank you. <laughs>